What is the subject here today? The secret of high net worth families dynasty trusts and why they're not just for the ultra wealthy. That's one of the key points we want to make. You might not consider yourself to be ultra wealthy. This is a no brainer. We're going to show you why. And as we get started, I want you to take a moment to ask yourself, why did you join us here today? We thank you so much for joining us. But are you concerned about protecting everything that you've worked so hard for throughout your life? Do you want to protect it for future generations? Are you worried about taxes, divorces, lawsuits? I mean, who is it? This webinar could change your family's future. We want you to imagine what's possible for you, your children, and even your grandchildren and future great-grandchildren when you take the right steps now to protect all that you've worked so hard for. We don't want it to get lost for no good reason when we have these incredible tools available. So what are the key topics we're gonna to cover here today? Um, Mike, do you wanna take us through the, the topics we're going to cover? Sure, uh, as, as Mark said, the, the, the focus is on dynasty trusts. Uh, sometimes we get worried that the terminology makes it sound like you have to have you know, $30 million for these trusts to make sense. I mean, not at all. Uh, countless of our clients who have a home and nothing more, uh, who have maybe a $300,000 estate still utilize these trusts. So we'll go through why it makes sense. We're going to talk about what the heck it is uh, and how does it work. We'll define it, make it understandable and how it benefits your family, the protections that you capture, really regardless of the size of your estate. And then the practicalities, how is it incorporated into your plan? What do you do? How do you make this thing happen? Um, and we always make the point, by the way, this uh, webinar is for informational purposes only. This is not client attorney individual uh, advice. If we have a relationship with you and talk with you, of course, that's different. But uh, this is informational only as we proceed. And by the way, if you have any comments or questions, please utilize the chat function and we'll leave some time function. at the end. Q &A I'm sorry, the, the Q&A right. function, yeah. Q&A. And uh, yes. insert any questions, we'll try to get to them at the end. Absolutely. So as we jump in, let's go through a little mystery, a tale of supercharging mm -hmm. a plan. Larry and Wyatt. Think of them as living the same lives, but there's just one difference. So Larry, his father leaves him $2 million for his benefit. Larry gets divorced at some point. He's sued at another point. When Larry passes away, there's nothing there for his children. And of course, nothing there for his grandchildren. So $2 million from his, his dad goes to zero. Wyatt, same thing. His dad leaves $2 million for his benefit. Wyatt also gets divorced. He also gets sued and loses. But his children from that $2 million end up with $6 million, and his grandchildren from that $2 million get $18 million, an $18 million difference over two generations. What's the mystery? What was the difference? And for those of you, I think many of you probably know our firm, but Mike, why don't you introduce Gilfix in the poll to, to the audience here today, for those who don't know us. Sure. Uh, we have been doing this uh, law firm practice for about 40 years now. We started in 1983. Remarkable longevity. Uh, before that, many of you know that I, uh, I created the first free legal aid program for the elderly, folks like me uh, in the in the country, Senior Adults Legal Assistance, which still thrives in Santa Clara County. In 1983, after we had a kid, uh, this guy named Mark, we realized we had to make a living. So my wife and I, who also went to Stanford Law School, created our law firm. And we've been focusing on asset protection, long-term care issues, where I would, I would say close to unique in that we have the highest, most sophisticated type of tax planning expertise. And we also understand Medi-Cal, government benefits, long-term care, and special needs. We have indeed served thousands and thousands of individuals from the northern tip, Wairika, down to the San Diego and south, um, clients in some other states as well. But of course, our focus is on Californians. That's our prime expertise. The goal of our firm, and we have been doing it successfully for 40 years, provide extraordinary service, get to know you, provide peace of mind to everybody. So as we proceed, you'll see our philosophy, our approach. We welcome you to become our clients. We'll talk about that at the end. So welcome. Yeah, and really, what's what's the ultimate way? And this is actually kind of a, an interesting way to think about it. What's yeah. the ultimate way to protect assets for future generations? Well, don't leave your kids anything. Like literally, don't <laughs> leave them a penny. In in fact, I think that's probably what my parents are doing. And but no, it's not quite that simple. Of course, 
no assets are going to be exposed if you don't leave a penny to your kids. Um, but most families who work with us, they want to leave something for their kids. Um, and that's where dynasty trusts come in. And we want to make a point here. For those of you, you may be familiar with Bottom Line, uh, the magazine. Um, it's awesome. We have many family friends who read this regularly. I've read it for many years. And Mike had an article about dynasty trusts in this month's issue. In fact, it's out today, the February issue of Bottom Line magazine. If you're a subscriber, you see an article on dynasty trusts authored by Michael Gilfix, who's here with us today. So you are talking to one of America's top experts in this area. And it's nice to see this validation. We're going to send this article out to our client community um, when it's ready. Any thoughts about how this article can be helpful to folks. Uh, you know, I think it's a good read. It was, it's designed not for attorneys. We do a lot of writing. We do a lot of articles in legal publications, many of them. I author a form book for lawyers as well, but this is for everybody. Uh, it's understandable. It's not going to say anything we're not going to cover today, uh, but I think it's worth reading. And if you'd like to get a copy of it, if you're not already on our mailing list and receive it, just let us know. We'd be happy to send you a copy. Uh, it's understandable is the key in this article. Yeah, and, and basically that, you know, that mystery of don't leave your kids a penny, it doesn't mean you don't leave anything for their benefit. You should leave it instead to a family protection trust for your child's benefit. There's plenty in the media. Michael Gilfix is a source of some of the, the information in the media, but it's been, there's many articles in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. Uh, it, it is not a, a new concept, but I think it's a new concept for everyday American families. This has been something that ultra high net worth families have been doing for a long time. And we think your family should get this benefit too, whether or not you're high net worth. Why is it so powerful? Why would you not leave any assets to your kids? But why instead would you leave it to family protection trusts? And by the way, family protection trusts are our firm's version of dynasty trusts. That's why we're. this is our type of, of dynasty trust. Now, Three big benefits. We're going to expand on each of these in just a moment. One, if you leave assets to your child and they get divorced, if they commingle those assets, a big chunk could be lost in a divorce. If it's in a family protection trust, it should be separate. It should not be lost in a divorce. If your child is sued, if they inherit assets directly, those, those assets are completely exposed in a lawsuit. If it's in a family protection trust, there's a barrier. There's some protection against creditors of your children and people going after them in a lawsuit. And when your child passes away when assets go to your grandchildren or future grandchildren. If you leave assets to them directly, it's all part of their estate. It's exposed to estate taxes. If it's in a family protection trust, there is a very high level of protection against future estate tax exposure. Maybe not 100%, but very, very high, potentially saving even millions of dollars, even if you don't start out with that much. We'll talk about that in a second too. And you might think, well, this is all great, but I don't want to create a complicated, overwrought trust where my child has to answer to somebody else for the rest of their life. If you're okay with it, your child can control the trust at a certain age when you feel that's appropriate. So really powerful, three protections. And, and Mike, you saw this report on NPR um, a few weeks ago. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, NPR is a source of uh, lots of reliable information, sometimes critical, but this, art, this, uh, this piece that they did on dynasty trusts Here's the quote. That's how wealthy people avoid estate tax, protect assets for future generations. And by the way, this is why just a statement of fact is that on Bernie Sanders um, platform statement when he was running for president, he very explicitly said we have to get rid of dynasty trusts. Why? Because they help people avoid exposure to estate tax. And uh, Bernie, you know, he's very consistent. Uh, he He's an advocate of increasing taxes, especially on wealthier folks. But really on everybody. Um, and uh, therefore, he doesn't like this this type of a trust. It's acknowledged that they work. Uh, in California, these trusts protect assets from, we'll go through the benefits and the protections in a moment, for three generations. That's important to know. And we emphasize two points at the bottom of this slide. Number one, we say it again and again, not just for the mega wealthy. It really is for everybody. It's just smart. And we believe that in the vast majority of cases, it's crazy not to do it. Well, let's talk. Let's expand let's move on, on the benefits. Divorce. Okay. So benefit number one, divorce. Um, if you leave assets directly to your child, Time moves along when they get married. And the second bullet point here, assets get, here's this legal term, commingled. When a child inherits assets, when they do, it is separate property when they receive it. If they keep it separate, 
it would continue to be separate property. But in most situations, after an inheritance, time moves along. Most of those assets end up in both names. No nefarious motivation. Uh, they might buy a property and the title company just automatically puts it in both names. They set up a new account at Dean Witter, whatever. If subsequently there's a divorce, all of the assets that ended up with both names are presumptive become community property and they are split 50 50 and your child loses up to half of the inheritance. What we always talk about is the situation where after somebody inherits the spouse, the son-in-law here, you know, pillow talk says, you know, we're in this life together. Come on. Everything should be in both of our names. We, 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 we handle our finances together. Of course you should make that change. And your child's response scripted is, I'd love to do this. I'd love to make that change, but I can't. This is an irrevocable trust that my parents set up for me. And secretly, she may be saying, you know, hallelujah. Thank you, mom and dad. Um, again, you know, the divorce rate is 50%. It continues to be. So we just have to be realistic about this and know that it happens. So when That's you leave assets... Yeah. yeah, sorry. And I just want to add something to that, that it's not against the in-law, by the way, especially if you're if your child already has kids, their simple answer is one, my parents set this up for me. And two, this is to protect our children together. If we add you, we take this out of the trust, you know, we lose all these protections. So I think it's not just against the in-laws because a lot of our clients love their in-laws. But hey, you know, things change. Yeah. And, and it's an open book. I mean, we always recommend, frankly, that the son-in-law, daughter-in-law be brought into this. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about the other protections that really protect inheritance for the grandchildren. The divorce is more living for your child, but the other two are really focused on the grandkids, you know, the kids of your child and your son-in-law and your daughter-in-law. So again, it's in their interest as well. Nothing negative here, nothing. We're just objective in building in protection. So if assets are instead, let's go back, Mark, to the uh, divorce. If assets instead go into the dynasty trust, you are segregating those assets for your child. It's like doing a prenup for your child or a postnup if they're already married. You're going to lock in protected treatment of those assets that you leave your child, and they will not be subject to division when, if, you know, God forbid, if there is a divorce. So we're protecting assets for the grandchildren because they're going to be intact. Okay, next litigation. Uh, this is a litigious society. Look, you know, you look at your screen, lawyers, lawyers are everywhere. You never know where the next lawsuit <laughs> might be coming from. Could happen anytime. Um, if you leave assets directly to your child and she is sued, those assets are exposed to a collection assets, uh, to a collection action. Now, if instead you leave assets to the family protection or dynasty trust, keep in mind, the trust owns those assets. Your child doesn't. We believe that the approach that we take will protect assets from litigation and collection. So far, we cannot guarantee this because these these uh, trusts are untested in California. We can guarantee, however, that they will deter the vast majority of litigants. Keep in mind, for somebody to go after this trust to try to collect money from it, they already had to go through a trial because by definition, the matter didn't settle where there would have been payment. They'd have to go through a trial, win, and then do a second action, paying all those legal fees. So at minimum, these trusts are going to be a deterrent. In practicality, we believe they're safe from litigation collection. Can't guarantee it yet. We're looking forward to the future when these court, when these uh, trusts will be tested. Hopefully not ours, of course, but uh, yeah. we're highly confident as we go forward. The, yeah, it's the deterrent, the deterrent effect. Um, you know, we, we have litigators in our practice. If you ever face litigation issues, contact us. But Mike yeah. and I are not litigators, but I have a lot of friends who are. And if they see a protective trust like this, they are going to settle for pennies on the dollar because they don't want to have to go through the huge hassle of trying to break the trust. So again, untested, but deterrence is the name of the game. And there's no perfectly protected trust. Um, and I think it's important to, to just revisit the power of compound growth. So you might think of yourself as, as not having that much today. This goes to, should I create a family protection trust for my kids? Do I have enough? It goes to, should I worry about estate taxes? We can also help with that. But it also goes to the growth during your child and your grandchildren's lives and how money can grow. So there's just a simple diagram of the rule of 72. So you might, you might be familiar with this. The rule of 72 just says if your money grows at 7.2% annually, it will double in value every 10 years. 
And that's doubles every 10 years. So doubles in the first 10. And then it really, from the first dollar amount, quadruples after 20 years, then up 8x after 30 years, because if it keeps doubling every 10 years. So the point here is that if we can protect $1 million for your child from, from lawsuits and divorce and, and other, other problems, it lets it grow. If your child invests it decently, it should double every 10 years or so. And hopefully your child's going to be alive a lot longer after you. Hopefully you're going to be alive a lot longer. So whatever you have now should hopefully be more when you pass away. And through your child's life, that's where that money can double, triple, quadruple. And that's where these trusts can have extraordinary protections um, when we look across generations. So let's just talk about that estate tax issue. So the assets in a family protection trust are largely protected from estate taxes when your child passes away. So when you leave assets to your child's trust, your family, their protection trust, they could be exposed to estate tax. If your estate is larger than the current exemption of 12.92 million, okay, the money be taxed before it goes into the family protection trust. Once it's there, the first 12.92 million, the current exemption amount, the current amount you can pass, pass tax-free is protected from estate taxes but it's the 12.92 million plus growth during your child's life. So if it doubles or triples during your child's life, all or most of that is not touched by estate taxes when your child passes away. So let's say your child starts out, you leave, you know, we'll give, we'll give an example in a second of how this can be extraordinarily powerful. Um, it is important to note that currently you can pass up to 12.92 million per person to your kids tax-free, that's gonna drop to about six and a half or seven million per person in 2026. So we gotta be cognizant of that. And this does have an impact on how much a family protection trust can protect. But the key thing, key issue here is there's a huge amount protected when it goes into the trust, but then the growth within the trust is largely unexposed to estate taxes when your kid passes away. So if that grows, there's no family protection trust there. 40% of what you left your kid could be lost in estate taxes. If it's in family protection trust, a huge portion of that is protected and it goes without being touched by taxes for your grandkids. We can't predict the future of estate tax laws, but you know there's a very good argument that in 20, 30 years, estate taxes could be much more strict than they are today, which makes it even more important to plan ahead and leave assets to your kids in a way where they're not exposed to those taxes or largely not exposed. So let's just give a quick example of this. So let's say Joe and Ann have a $6 million estate. So they have a house in the Bay Area and retirement accounts and maybe a life insurance policy. You know, in the, in the Bay Area or, or the nicer parts of coastal California, you know, you have a house, you're probably getting close to that. Um, they leave it directly to their son, John. They have one kid. If they leave it directly to him, um, when John, let's say it doubles during John's life um, to $12 million. When he passes away, let's assume the exemption is at that $7 million a person level. Well, over 2 million of that could be lost to the IRS before it goes to their grandkids. If it goes into a family protection trust and John leaves it in the trust and invests it well, and he can use it during his life, let's say it grows to 12 million. If it's in the family protection trust, zero lost to the IRS. And that's just in one generation. So imagine this compounded for another 20, 30, 40, 50 years for the next generation. So we're talking about, you start out with what you might not consider to be a huge estate. I mean, 6 million is not small, uh, but in California, you know, that's the value of a house and maybe just a couple other investments that can lead to millions in, in estate tax savings if you create a family protection trust versus just leaving it directly to your child. Um, anything you want to add there, Mike? I think that's, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around how big these numbers can get across generations, but it is extraordinary. Yeah, I just you know sometimes when we do projections, logical projections about the future future growth of assets, the numbers are so significant that we sometimes don't even share them because they seem like we're making them up. Yeah. Uh, it's a safe statement, however, yeah. that when you think about assets growing and being there for three generations, that's like what 60, 80, 90 years of growth, the numbers are staggering. They're absolutely staggering. So we have yeah. to accept the reality of mathematics. And if even if it doesn't double in, we're not getting 7.2% these days, but if it's less, okay, it'll double in 12 years, maybe 13. So compounding is important. Have to think about the future and the grandkids and the great grandkids. Yeah. And, and we just have to point out that if your estate as an individual is larger than the current 12.92 exemption, and if you leave more than that, to a family protection trust. Well, one, you'd have some potential estate tax exposure before it gets to the trust, but then even once in the trust, 
maybe not all of it would be protected from future estate taxes. It gets kind of complex in the calculations, but the bottom line is it's still hugely protected. And even if you're over that $12.92 million limit, there's still protection against divorce and against lawsuits. So regardless of the size of your state, the larger your state, frankly, the more powerful these are, but regardless, they're, they're just so extraordinary. And let's circle back to that mystery we talked about, Larry and Wyatt, each of them, $2 million left for their benefit. Each of them gets divorced, each of them gets sued. Larry, he inherited the money directly. So when he got divorced, he had commingled. Half of it was lost there. Later, a lawsuit. The assets were in his name, no protections. The rest of it was gone. Zero to his kids and obviously zero to his grandchildren. Wyatt, on the other hand, $2 million came to him, but in the form of a family protection trust. So Wyatt never actually owned that money. It was in a trust for his benefit. And that meant when Wyatt got divorced, that money wasn't lost because it was in the family protection trust. When Wyatt was sued, the litigants saw the trust and said, ah, I'm going to settle for pennies on the dollar. I'm not going to touch that. So that $2 million was able to grow during his life. It was able to double and even triple during his lifetime because he invested it reasonably well. Ended up being $6 million when he passed away, but his kids still benefited from the trust. They were protected from divorce and lawsuits. And it grew again during their lives. It tripled again to $18 million. So that's just kind of a simple explanation for how $2 million up front can become $18 million in two generations without extraordinary luck. If it's just invested decently and used reasonably during your children's and grandchildren's lives, this can be the difference of tens of millions of dollars for kind of everyday families. I mean, if you own a house. So it's just, again, hard to wrap your head around it. But this is why we think it's such, such a no-brainer for, for most families. Um, and Mike, why don't you talk about how we can use these, why we want to create these trusts right away, and, and some examples. This is not complete, how they can be used while you're still around and alive. So it's not just a matter of leaving assets upon your passing to these trusts for your kids. It's not. Many individuals utilize these trusts by transferring assets into them while they're living. One of the best examples, one of the best examples, and we have facilitated this on many occasions for our local residents. Um, you have a kid, kid gets married. You want them to live nearby. What the cost of housing? What new emerging family can afford a house around here? So the source of the down payment, or maybe even more, is from mom and dad. So what do they do? Do they give money to their son? Do they give money to their son and daughter? What approach should they take? Here's a perfect example of utilizing the Family Protection Trust. And the simple example we have here, uh, they're gonna buy a $1 million house, wherever that might be around here, a $1 million house, uh, and they need $200,000 for the down payment and they don't have it. So mom and dad transfer $200,000 to make a gift to their child's Family Protection Dynasty Trust. That money is used for the down payment. When they take title to that new property, a minimum of a 20% interest in the house is going to be owned by the dynasty trust. It may be as much as 50%, by the way, because you know, at the beginning, 100% of the value, it's only from the down payment, uh, is actually from money from the dynasty trust. There's a negotiation to figure out what percentage the dynasty trust should own. The other portion is owned by your child and the daughter-in-law as community property in their trust. Okay, going forward, if there ever is a divorce, in this example, the 20% interest remains with your child and the other, the 80% would be split 50-50. So each of them, so the, the uh, daughter-in-law would have a 40% interest in the house, not a 50%. In the last one that I worked with, the down payment was $500,000 and the dynasty trust took a 50% interest. And in that case, if there was a divorce, the child would really walk away with 75% of that property, right? Because all of the uh, dynasty trust interest, which is a 50% interest, and half of the community property interest, which would be 25%, right? So 75% in that mathematical computation would stay with your child in the unlikely event of a divorce. So it's, it's just being practical and keeping the money in the family. Many other individuals will make transfers into dynasty trust because they have taxable estates. Or maybe they just want their child to be able to enjoy and utilize the money while you are living. It gives the kids an opportunity to say thank you, right? To acknowledge the gift, which is not irrelevant. When they get it after you're gone, they may say thank you, but you're probably not going to hear it. <laughs> Will so, you hear it? Yes. 
You never know. Uh, but it's nice to be thanked. It's nice to move money along. They can use it more than you can. Often that's the rationale as well. But again, here we have somebody who's thinking about estate tax avoidance. By shifting significant assets to the dynasty trust now, that asset is obviously removed from the parent's estate. If it's a growth asset, the growth is going to happen outside of the parent's taxable estate. Whereas if it grew in $100,000 in value and they have a large estate, $40,000 of that $100,000 will go to the government because of the 40% estate tax. So removing assets, shifting them to the next generation kind of freezes the value as you transfer it. If that $100,000, in my simple example, $100,000 transfer is made, the parents have to file a gift tax return. They utilize a very small portion of their lifetime gift and estate tax protection, very modest. And again, they've shifted that asset out of their estate permanently. Makes a great deal of sense. We often integrate this with other types of tax planning to put uh, to put estate tax planning on. They kind of supercharge the planning. Uh, some of you have our book, um, Beat Estate Tax Forever. It explain so many of the strategies that we utilize, which can be combined with the utilization of this dynasty trust to put everything on steroids, to put the planning on steroids. So uh, we have to think about this as, a, as an opportunity right now while you're living, not just to employ upon your passing, either or both makes a great deal of sense yeah. as we go and forward. If you're concerned, yeah, if you, if you are high net worth and concerned about estate tax, we have a webinar called Estate planning for high net worth families on our Gillifix Law YouTube channel. So again, subscribe, check that video out. Video out. We have give a lot more examples, and of course, get our book, Michael's book, Eat Estate Tax Forever. For that. And, and, uh, and let me insert by the one of the questions asked if this is going to be recorded. Virtually all of our webinars we're putting on our Gillifix Law channel on YouTube. So yeah. uh, if you go to that channel, you'll find this and many, many other webinars that we've presented. So please do. We want to share this information and spread the word. So please do. Yes. And actually, here's a real example. It, it, I've changed the facts just a little bit to protect client confidentiality. But this is, I think, a good example of what Mike just talked about. Marvin S., let's call him Marvin S., uh, was a CFO of a startup that was doing really well. And he was concerned about future estate taxes. He was confident the company was going to go big. He wasn't sure because you never know. But he was very hopeful that the company was going to go exponentially, grow exponentially in value. So he worked with us. This was actually five years ago or so. He had two daughters. He created family protection trusts, one for each daughter, and he made a small gift. He said, you know what? My the share, my shares in my startup aren't very valuable right now. They're pennies a share. I'm going to transfer $9,000 worth of stock to the family protection trust for each of my daughters. And as Mike said, he has to file a gift tax return. You can't make you can't use the $17,000 annual exemption if it's a gift to a trust. That's a little convoluted. Let's not worry about that. A very small tax fine. Just tell the IRS, I use $9,000 of my $12.92 million exemption. Okay, it's not a big gift. Five years later, the company went public and those $9,000 worth of shares of stock were now worth over a million dollars. So he just removed basically a million dollars from his estate for the benefit of his kids and he only had to use up $9,000 of his lifetime exemption. That could save $400,000 in future estate taxes. And actually, our example was more than this. Um, the guy's company went public and ended up saving about probably 2 or $3 million um, from estate tax exposure. So thinking ahead, and that could be any, it doesn't have to be a startup stock. It could be index funds. It could be real estate. Um, but you're removing, you take the value today, and if it grows in value in the future in the Family Protection Trust, hey, it's not part of your estate. It can avoid estate taxes. Um, who can be in charge of these trusts? And Mike, why don't you talk about how people typically structure this? Let's go through that. So when you create the Family Protection Trust, the Dynasty Trust, at the outset, typically our clients, you, mom and dad, uh, would be the trustees of the trust. There's no reason not to do that. It doesn't have any money yet. Um, once assets go into the trust, by the way, mom and dad would probably not be the trustees because then there would be some argument that those assets would still be in their taxable estate because of the control they would have. So once assets go in, we typically have either the child take over as trustee or maybe some other family member who might be the trustee in that circumstance. So at the outset, typically mom and dad, key point, your child can be trustee of her own family protection trust. Somebody else doesn't take over. A bank doesn't take over. Your child decides how to invest the money, how to grow the money, how to utilize the money for her own benefit. She'd be the trustee. 
as well as being the beneficiary. So her hands are not tied. She does have control. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. To respond to one of the questions, this is an irrevocable trust. But that just means the terms of the trust can't be changed. The terms of the trust give the trustee tremendous flexibility and power when it comes to the investment and utilization of the assets. So you're not locked into the initial investments. If they want to sell a particular asset, stock, property, mutual fund, they can do that. They can reinvest. They are in charge of how the money is going to be managed. Key point. Uh, it is important to note that your child, if you set up one of these trusts for your child, your child is the only uh, beneficiary. So technically, you couldn't use money in that trust to pay uh, your child, could not use the money in that trust to pay uh, her husband's medical bill. There's ways of managing that so everybody has an advantage. But the terms of the trust do have to be, uh, have to be honored so the integrity of the trust is not eroded. But again, with with creative thinking, there's always a way of taking care of this. When it comes to adding your kids as a trustee, you may feel, gee, you know, do I want my kid age 22 to be the trustee of the trust? Uh, I think when most of us were 22, we were arguably a bit more mature. You know, today's 22 is today's 15 year old in so many ways. So we do worry about maturity, being able to manage money. So you can say in the trust, my child can be his own trustee, but not until he's 30, 35, any age that you choose. You have control and make that decision. Sometimes you have a child who just can't manage money. And then somebody else has to be the trustee. It might be a relative, a friend. It could be a professional fiduciary. We don't really encourage that, but sometimes it is the wise choice. It is irrevocable. Your child can be in charge, can manage the assets. Yeah, irrevocable, but very flexible within it. If you're if you're smart about how you manage it. And, and actually, just to add on to your point, naming a third-party trustee, we have many clients who say, look, my, my son is great, but he's terrible with money. He has bad influences in his life. I just don't feel comfortable with him ever being fully in charge. So you can name a co-trustee to serve with your child indefinitely, um, just to have someone else watching things over with or for them. Um, so as we think about how a family, how can you put this all into place? Um, how is it a part of your plan? Well, I think the key thing here is there's no one size fits all approach. Every family we meet has their own issues, their own nuances, their own goals, their own dreams, their own worries. And it's part of your overall plan. We'll go into just some of the details of how you'd incorporate this. But we want to point out a, a family protection trust is not for everyone. Um, not even if you want to protect assets for the next generation, if you have a child with a disability, well, hey, you got to incorporate a special needs trust. We very commonly will have families you meet with us with a child in the autism spectrum. Maybe they have two kids. So the child in the autism spectrum, we create a special needs trust for that child and a family protection trust for the other child. And there are all sorts of other nuances. Um, every family is different. And we really think you want to have an integrated estate and financial plan and an integrated team. So we want your financial advisors to talk to your legal advisors hand in hand to make sure your assets are coordinated, your plan is coordinated, and we can help with that. We're, we're, we're building a network of some amazing financial advisors we're working very closely with. If you don't have one, if you do, we love chatting with your advisors and making sure everything is brought together properly. And we always hammer this. You may, if you watch a lot of our talks, you may be tired of this, but we have to remind you. So, Mike, Prop 19, why is it so important for every Californian family to be aware of this? We always have to think about it. And, you know, I, I want to go just a quick comment on the last uh, discussion that Mark uh, that Mark offered to all of us. Um, one of the quite we have. Wow, we have a lot of questions already, like yeah, we'll a dozen, so uh, a dozen already. Um, one of the questions is, well, why didn't why when I talked with my lawyer, why why didn't he have me do this type of a trust? Uh, d doesn't my living trust take care of all these things? Well, no. I mean, we even we don't know everything. Even our law firm doesn't know everything. Um, some of us are a little more complete. The sophisticated arguably raise points that others don't. So it isn't that somebody was wrong in not advising you about it. It isn't like it's malpractice or anything like that. But, you know, a lot of some attorneys don't um, utilize this approach very much, perhaps don't understand it. If you use a, one of the very low cost services, there's no doubt you're not going to hear about this. So, you know, a revocable living trust does many things, but it does not provide these multi-generational benefits that the dynasty trust provides. A point to emphasize and reemphasize your revocable trust does not provide these benefits because it probably 
leaves assets directly to the kid. And going back to one of the first slides we had, remember, remember we said, don't leave anything to your child. If, if you don't use the dynasty trust, that's the emphasis on the special needs. Either it's going to be a special needs trust if you have that issue, or it's going to be a dynasty trust. That's the gold-plated advice, regardless of the size of your estate. Now, Prop 19, we have to mention it and reemphasize it and reemphasize it. Uh, we have other webinars on this. So when you go to our Guilfix Law channel, you can focus in on this. This is the new law, which says that there will be a reassessment on your real property, your home, your rental property, your cottage, whatever it may be at your passing when there's a change in title, when a child inherits it. Going into a family protection trust, by the way, does not avoid this problem because it's a change in title. So if you give property away directly to a child or leave it directly to a child, property taxes could increase a thousand percent. Dramatic, dramatic increases. The point, we have developed tools to let you lock in the current level of, of uh, property tax protection, even as you pass along ownership to your, to your child or children. So the challenge and the opportunity is to integrate Proposition 19 property tax planning, which can save hundreds of thousands of dollars for your kids going forward with dynasty trust planning, which can also keep that asset out of the estate. So again, supercharging proactive planning as we address some of the tax exposures that you have. And by the way, the Prop 19 issue, your estate may be $2 million because you only own a house. This issue is yours. Owning real property means this new development in California law is your issue if you want your kids to have the option of preserving ownership of the house after you pass away. And just a reminder, not only is Mike published in Bottom Line Magazine this month, he also wrote a book called Beat Estate Tax Forever. If you work with us, you're probably familiar. If you're a client, we can give you a copy of this. If you're not, you can order it on Amazon or through our office. But it covers a lot of sophisticated estate tax planning issues. And chapter nine of this book goes into some of what we talked about regarding family protection trusts. So we think about this all the time. I like to point out, when my we go on, we used to go on annual camping trips. We got to do one this year, actually. Uh, and we literally like we'll sit around a campfire nerding out about <laughs> this. I mean, it's funny. Is it sad? Maybe, but you know, this is what we live and breathe. So I think it's important to point we're we're a family that serves families, but it's not just us. We have amazing attorneys outside of Mike and I. We have Nick Klingenberg, Renee Conrad. Um, Francis LaPole, a tax genius. So we're a bigger team. So it's not just us. We have an amazing team. But I do want to now talk about how our team, no matter who you work with at our office, can help you to incorporate family protection trust into your plan. I mean, it's just a meeting with us. And if you're an existing client, maybe you already have these in place. And we can take a fresh look. Do you have the right structure in place? Is your living trust structured right? Do you have the right trustees named in your family protection trust? And if you don't have them and you want to add them, well, it's two key steps. We have to update your living trust so it doesn't direct money directly to your kids, but instead to family protection trusts. And for any child for whom you want to create these protections, you create a separate family protection trust. So let's say you have three kids, all three of them. You think a family, you want to protect assets for multiple generations. They don't have special needs issues. Okay, we create one family protection trust for each child. We don't want it embedded in your living trust. Um, we've seen versions where people's trusts say, well, when I pass away, this will become a, a dynasty trust. That gets complicated. If you want to update your trust in the future, it can cause problems. You can't do any lifetime planning with that. We like to keep things elegant and simple for our clients. So we always recommend they should be separate standalone trusts for these and other reasons. So you update your living trust, you add the family protection trust, and then you coordinate your financial planning with that. But it's not super complicated. You have to think about at what age would your child potentially be able to step in to manage his or her own trust or who might you want to name as a trustee for your child to step in if you're not there and if you don't think your child can handle it. Um, so the bottom line is we think this is a no-brainer for most families and everybody. Um, but if you're concerned about these issues, lawsuits, divorce protection, estate tax protection, it's kind of like getting a life, a hundred year insurance policy for future generations. It may not be needed, but if it is, oh my gosh, can it save? It can, it can save so much money and it can cause, so it can create a nice barrier around everything you've worked for to, again, to protect it against divorces, lawsuits, and future estate taxes. And this is kind of cynical, but if you look ahead 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we believe, and for better or worse, the families that put these tools into place will be far better off than the families that don't. 
again, look at the math. Um, life is not fair. Tax laws are not fair. We're not. <laughs> we're here just to educate you about what you can do. The families that put these into place, you look ahead, one, two, three generations, they're going to be in such a better place than families that don't. And we get it. Not everything is about tax and asset protection, but knowledge is power. And you worked so hard for everything. It's not easy to, to own a house in California. You worked hard for that. It's not easy to save. Life is expensive. So everything you work so hard for, we just want to give you all the tools that are available to protect future generations. And we don't want you to lose this opportunity. So if you don't have these in place, or if you haven't worked with us yet, meet with us. We'd love to get to know you. We can help review your plan or help you put a great plan into place, revocable living trust, up to date, hours of attorney up to date, advanced directives for you, and adding these family protection trusts. But regardless, we want to make sure it's the right fit for you so we can look at your overall structure, your situation, and we can help you figure out the right overall approach. We're going to get to questions in just a minute. We have so many good questions. We do. Um, so if you do want to meet with us, if you are already a client, well, you know how to find us. Um, our availability, availability is limited, but we, we can plan to set a time with you if you'd like to meet with us. So contact us. You can call us 650-493-8070, gilfix.com. Very easy to find us. If you'd like us to reach out to you, you can leave your contact information in the Q&A function, and we'll take those names and contact information down. We'll reach out to you to set a meeting. Um, for people who are not yet clients, um, we welcome the chance to meet you. And if you like to, if we want to make sure it's a good fit, we're happy to do a 15-minute complimentary Q&A call. Um, but if you're ready to work with us, we'd sit down and we dive into planning. And there is so much that we can achieve. And I think the main main point we want to make here is you do not need to be ultra high net worth or even high net worth, whatever those numbers mean to you, for these trusts to be powerful and for them to benefit your family. And we don't want only ultra wealthy families and their kids to benefit from this. Everybody should be able to benefit from this. We hate the term dynasty trust. That's why our versions are family protection trusts because you don't need dynastic wealth to do this. So we would welcome the chance to connect with you. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to our Guild Fix Law channel. If you're watching this on YouTube later, please share this thumbs up, comment. Um, and we hope you got a lot out of this. Now, that was a lot. We're gonna get to some questions. Uh, so Mike, why don't you take the first question and and thank you guys for, so, for spending time with us and for so many good questions. We have so many good questions. So really, we have a thir 13 questions so far. Uh, we've already addressed a couple of them. One asks, does use of a life estate avoid Prop 19 problems? No, it does not. There's still a change in title ultimately there. So no, that doesn't work. Uh, the approach that has to be taken is, you know, frankly, more detailed, sophisticated. It's not simple. So this kind of a shortcut just won't work. Uh, Melinda, oh, a four-part question there. Uh, one of the bottom lines is that um, if there's uh, two spouses, you have separate trusts and you, you own real property in another state, if you have uh, your own trust and you bought some property in Colorado, the Colorado property would also be titled in your trust. That's essential to avoiding probate. That's not on dynasty trust, but that's on titling assets. And there's other parts of the question that kind of go beyond what we've covered today. Forgive me. And, um, and what, uh, what about Raymond's question? Can IRAs be placed or left to a family protection trust? Uh, you would not do that. If that would be a distribution out of the IRA, all of that would become income taxable. So that probably well, would not work. You, you can though, correct? You can do it. It, it just speeds up you the distribution. could, but it raises other tax issues. So <laughs> isn't it great when we disagree? Isn't that yeah, wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a nuanced question. We'd have to talk to you about. You have to talk to your income tax yeah. um, expert about that as well. But you you can, but there's some trade-offs. Yeah, yeah, big, big, big ones. Um, Jim <laughs> uh, points out, we did one of these trusts for Jim and we pointed out in, in an explanatory letter that if you, if the creator of the trust, dad, is the trustee of the trust and you put money into it, and you're the trustee when you pass away, that that could expose uh, those assets uh, to inclusion in your estate. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier, that that's why when funds are actually transferred during your lifetime into the dynasty trust, we strongly recommend that your child, if your child is uh, going to be your trust, the trustee ultimately, have your child take over as trustee then, that you, we would typically have you resign so that we avoid that problem, that potential problem. It's not a sure yeah, thing that's going to come up. Yeah, if your estate is well below the estate tax limit, it may not be an issue though. So it's it's a right. case by case basis. But if it's a larger state, your goal is to avoid estate taxes. Yeah, we recommend that you step down. And let's emphasize that. You know, as we respond quickly to some of these questions, we always have to know more. I mean, we can give a quick answer, but most of the answers ultimately depend on knowing everything about your estate. 
yeah. because we can say something that seems wise in the moment, but we didn't know about these three other factors and that changes everything. So yeah. let's be careful about that. Um, you uh, know, I want to be clear, there was one question, what is NPR? We had this slide about NPR oh, says yeah. it's national public radio. Locally, it's KQED radio and television, uh, yeah. usually viewed as a pretty credible independent source. That's the source of that, uh, those quotations about the viability and power of dynasty trusts that we included. Yeah, I know. And I think we should just revisit this a question from Linda. And I think you may have addressed this, but I want to address it again. How does the family protection trust differ from, I think, a living trust? Um, so again, the living trust is what you or you and your spouse create together, it directs where your assets go after you're gone to avoid probate, lets you name successor trustees. But your living trust typically ends when you pass away. The dynasty trust, the family protection trust, is what where assets would flow to after you pass away. So if you come to us, you have two kids, and you say, I want family protection trust, we don't just create family protection trust. We create an updated version of your living trust that says when we pass away, these assets don't go to our kids, they go to these two separate family protection trusts, one for each child. So, and, and the fee structure is we charge a flat fee to, and we, we can go through that if we meet with you to go through the details. Our fees change over time, so we don't want to give numbers now. If you watch this six months from now, it'd be different. But um, typically we have a flat fee to prepare a living trust and a flat fee for each family protection trust. And, you know, by the way, I mean, on the, on the fee for a dynasty trust, the fees that I have seen range from like 4000 up to $10,000 per trust. We are definitely at the lower end of that. Yeah. But, you know, huge variation, huge variation in fees. Yeah, and I think it actually brings up another interesting point. When we talk about this asset protection, you know, sometimes we get questions about, well, I'm worried about lawsuits. What can I do? Can I put my money offshore in the, in the Cayman Islands or maybe create a North Dakota trust? And there are ways you can protect your own assets. Um, they're very expensive. They're cumbersome. You know, we're talking tens of thousands set up. You typically need a trustee in that jurisdiction to add money to it. Will they hold up in court? Again, no, not really proven. The beautiful thing about family protection trust is that you are, in a sense, creating this powerful structure for your kids because they never, once you have money in your name, it's very hard to protect it. It's doable, but it's very expensive and cumbersome. But because you're leaving money not to your kids, but to these troops, it's never theirs. So it's a lot more elegant and, and it's a lot simpler to provide at least some asset protection that would normally cost tens of thousands of dollars for them to do themselves. So I think it's important to frame this that way. I think a lot of people hear the terms like offshore trusts. That's what people do. Well, this is a not the same thing, but it's a version of that that you're doing for your kids and setting up ahead of time for your kids and grandkids. So maybe we take one or two more questions, Mike. So many good ones. Uh, and then we'll kind of uh, wrap this up. <laughs> One question is kind of about utilizing these trusts and about uh, rental property in California and a stepped up basis. Boy, is that complicated. Last week, our webinar was on capital gains tax, which addresses that issue when there's a step up, when there isn't. So you know, I think we just need to say that how you approach that question depends dramatically on the size of your estate, the likelihood that your kids would want to retain the property, would they sell it? That's got about a five or six element equation that we would go through before coming up with any reasonable advice. So just can't give you one short answer to that. Yeah. And our our, our webinar on capital gains taxes is already on our Gilfix Law YouTube channel. So check that out. But meet with us if you want to explore this in detail. We don't want you to make one one mistake when it comes to, to planning or taxes can undo <laughs> years of good work. So we want to make sure we get the chance to help you think those things through. We're not just attorneys who create trust documents and protective structures, we also help our clients as thought partners. We, we deal with real estate tax issues, investment tax issues, and helping people just to think strategically. We love that. All of our attorneys, we, we love to become thought partners yeah. for the families that we work with. Well, so, so. Um, and what I think last, last question, perhaps we take, like, does it have to be to your kids? Could you create a trust for friends or other beneficiaries? How would we think about that? If you have a uh, godchild or a niece or a nephew, you can certainly prepare this type of trust. Keep in mind, we're dealing multi-generationally. You would not do this for an age peer. So again, a lot of folks set these up for uh, for the niece or the nephew. And again, last week, a lady was in here and she set one up for a godchild. Absolutely, that can work. Um, and you know, there's one other Oh, Darren, other question. Oh, yeah. I want to clarify. Um, the question pertains to, it, does, does this approach avoid state inheritance tax or a state, state tax? We don't have such a tax in California, so it's irrelevant. There are a number hey. of states that do have it. 
a place where California is not worse than every other state for taxes. <laughs> yeah. We don't have an estate tax now. Don't don't make that sound like a suggestion or a hint for I know, some I know. legislature. Politicians, please uh, don't. Yeah. Well, we actually got rid of that with a voter initiative many years ago. So it took a voter initiative. The uh, California legislature sure didn't do it. So so it's complicated. And you know, a lot of the best questions, by the way, are from uh, anonymous folks. You didn't want to share your names. Understood. But, you know, I, it just makes the point you can only glean so much information from any webinar. Some yeah. the, the details of some of these questions just suggest that some of you folks have very complicated situations. You have assets. And you got to sit down with us. There's no shortcut. You're not going to get everything you need in a webinar. It just doesn't doesn't work that way. So yeah. we invite you. Give us a call. Let's get together and take care of it. Yeah. Gilfix.com. G-I-L-F-I-X. Both of our last names. Uh, not too hard to find us. We're, we're all over the place, for better or worse. <laughs> you might be sick of us. Although if you're watching, you chose to be here. So thank you again um, for spending time with us. Well, I think that was a lot. My head is spinning. Your heads are probably spinning a little bit, but I think, again, the key takeaway is don't worry about all the details. There are nuances, of course, we couldn't get to. We can't make 100% guarantees about everything. There's nuances to all of this, but we want to arm you with knowledge. As I like to say, an informed decision is a good one, no matter what direction you go. Some clients decide not to do these trusts for various reasons. Most of our clients do, but hey, I just want you to know you can do this. It's not just for the ultra wealthy. It's not just for the Getty family or the Musk family or the Jobs family, whatever it is. Um, anybody can benefit from this if they want to protect assets for future generations. So um, we hope everybody's staying safe, sane, and healthy out there, as my mom likes to say. Any final thoughts, Mike, before we wrap things up? No, you know, the number the number of the of attendees, you all, there's so many, and the question, they just... It just demonstrates how much interest there is. So we're really glad to have had this opportunity to spread the word. My bottom line article this month, um, if you'd like to get a, get a copy, let me know. It's uh, very much to the point, two pages uh, in Bottom Line Magazine. So a lot of interest. Interest is growing left and right. We look forward to talking with you. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Reach out. We'd love to get the chance to help you, but I hope you got so much out of this and spread the word. Share this if it could help anybody that you know. <laughs> Take care. Okay.